Hi, Zuby. Hi, Courtney. Good morning from here. From good morning from here. Well, good afternoon. Um, it's really nice to see you today. And thank you for joining us. So I'm, we're, let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, so Hi. we are th <laughs> we're thrilled to have the opportunity today to speak with Zuby Onruta about designing inclusive innovation. My hope is that people will walk away from this webinar with a stronger sense of how companies can start to reach the 1.3 billion people around the world who are disabled, starting with understanding the state of disability inclusion in tech and the broader disability movement. So we invite questions and comments at any point in the discussion, and we will get to them as efficiently as possible. And as you follow along, I encourage you to reflect on where your, inter where your industry intersects with disability and also what the cost might be to your company of doing nothing. And I also wanna preface this discussion by saying there's really no cookie cutter approach to diversity and inclusion that translates into every organization well. If there was, we wouldn't be discussing the trillion dollar losses that companies are collectively leaving on the table as a result of not getting it right. So fixing it involves a mindset shift, um, a change in the discussion with more active listening, and a change in approach to recruiting, hiring, training, mentoring, and even building, which we'll jump into with Zuby because that is his expertise. And that's why we're having this important discussion. So thanks for joining. Um, for a quick run of show, I'd like to invite Zuby to share his incredible personal journey and how he's achieved the success he has today. If you haven't heard his story, you'll soon discover he really is an inspiration. And we're gonna talk about the state of disability in tech today, including investable opportunities. Then we'll get into the business imperative for startups in particular to intentionally focus on disability inclusion to do that early. And finally, we'll get into some of the more practical recommendations for startups and actions that you can take to be more inclusive and reach this group. And if you're familiar with Zuby already and have heard him speaking from st the stages at venues like TEDx or South by Southwest, you'll know that he'll probably be sprinkling in some great examples of disabled tech founders and their companies along the way. So without further ado, uh, Zuby, your list of accomplishments and accolades goes on and on, but I, I wanted to highlight a few things. Um, for those that wanna follow along with, with Zuby's background, uh, his website is zubionwuta.com, so Z-U-B-Y-O-N-W-U-T-A.com. So as we already mentioned, you're a global speaker on fascinating topics like turning problems into solutions and overcoming disability. You're a disability and inclusion advocate to the US Congress and to the United Nations. You've also been awarded the US Presidential Service Award by President Barack Obama. You're a patented investor and founder of a tech company called Think and Zoom. And your work in the startup space is helping VCs and accelerators tap into the $8 trillion disability economy, which I know you want to unpack for us a little bit more today. You've been supported by reputable accelerators like On Deck and Mass Challenge, and you are currently an entrepreneur in residence at Verizon for disability innovation. You're also involved in angel investing and VC, and you launched the Future of Disability Summit last year, which will be taking place this October which is Disability Awareness Month. And to learn more about Zuby Summit, you can go to futureofdisability.global. And last, but certainly not least, you are an inclusive space ambassador and an astronaut in training. So Zuby, I'm gonna pause there and I would love to hear from you about your journey that got you here. Thanks so much, Courtney. Uh, I think you've covered it all. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> but thanks so much. I'm really uh, grateful for this opportunity. Many thanks to Ben at Olark and Roland for connecting us and 500 startups for this uh, amazing opportunity. And today, and this week is Global um, Accessibility Awareness uh, Day. Actually, it's uh, May 19th. So it's just, you know, right timing, right? You know. Uh, that we're talking about this topic uh, so it's really very exciting um i this all of this was unplanned all of this long uh, list that you just uh, talked about i i came with 200 dollars right after high school in nigeria all i wanted to do was be a medical doctor that, that's all i wanted to do <laughs> i liked uh, science and so i 
I started pre-med, I joined the US military, but then sadly within two years, I became legally blind through an inherited, uh, inherited uh, retinal disorder. So it's a problem that affects your retina and it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a genetic disorder and it manifests in teenage and late teenage years. And so within two years, uh, things, the eye chart that I could read from, uh, you're supposed to read it from 20 feet away. Well, my went down to 10 feet away, but in two, within two years, I went all the way down to one foot away. And so the military said, <laughs> uh, private on Muta, bye-bye, right? And so went away my uh, medical studies as well. And uh, I had to, uh, picked myself up after you know a long battle with just trying to figure out what to do and I went into computer engineering of all things uh, simply because I, I loved the, the science and STEM field and it was a very um, long battle because you know going in being legally blind and uh, this will be a theme of some of the things that we'll touch on. I think uh, the engineering department in the University of Illinois Chicago may, may have had 16 departments I don't know bioengineering uh, civil, mechanical, all kinds of things, right? It's a, it's a, it's a school of maybe 50,000 undergrads at the time that I went there 20 years ago. I was the only <laughs> disabled student in engineering. Wow. I was the only legally blind student in engineering. And so it was as tough as climbing mountains, right? You know, carry, carrying a backpack without, you know, uh, uh, climbing equipment. It was just tough as this. And uh, at some point I actually flunked out and uh, was homeless a little bit and had to fight my way back and managed to graduate. But as an engineering student, you have to do engineering things. I had the opportunity of working for Lucent Alcatel a couple of summers, uh, did full uh, stack web development is what it's called today. We built databases by hand with all code by hand. <laughs> And uh, a couple of times I worked for Goldman Sachs, including Wall Street. I wrote software that calculates all the companies, uh, electronic stock trades was $300 million per day at that time. So real time server callbacks, et cetera. And uh, dabbled a little bit with uh, XML uh, with them. And then I uh, graduated and started working at uh, IBM and uh, I was leading uh, global teams working on file systems, enterprise clients, uh, NASA, Bloomberg, the White House, Boeing, uh, highly available systems, rely highly reliable, no downtime allowed. And within two years of that, I found myself at the Crisco School for the Blind, uh, C-R-I-S-S-C-O-L-E, Crisco, because my uh, vision um, was never ever stable. And that's a whole different track of my life where I had started my own personal medical research into finding out why my symptoms never match my diagnosis. And that's how I went through 300 eye care professionals. But that, that's a whole different story. And, and um, you know, after I finished with the School for the Blind, I kept working, but my vision kept, you know, just uh, fluctuating and progressively declining. And uh, it wasn't until um, 2012, after spending two weeks at Johns Hopkins and just, for anybody that doesn't know, Johns Hopkins is one of the most renowned medical institutions in the world. You're not expected to spend two weeks there. You might spend two hours, two days tops, but I spent two weeks. <laughs> we were running all kinds of tests to really, really figure it out. And genetic testing showed that I have three retinal disorders. And that explained all the chaos. And shortly after that, I had to leave the engineering work. So that's why I really meant that none of all of this, you know, what was planned. I just, um, you know, now the medical was gone, the um, uh, uh, military was gone, the engineer was now gone. And I just made a conscious decision that I wanted to rewrite my own story for a better outcome. And, and hence the topics you mentioned, turning problems into global solutions and overcoming disability cognitive abilities. So that's how it all started. <laughs> It's amazing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Think and Zoom and how you embarked on this journey. Um, can you tell us how you got started and then what Think and Zoom does? So I've, I've given you a little bit of the beginning of the journey and now let me cover the, the, the missing track. So in, in 98, I get diagnosed with star guards. I get told I'm legally blind. and um, Two years before that was when I first got my driver's license. I went to the DMV, 
in five seconds, you know, a one, two, five, you're out. Kid, you know, I can drive now. Great. Two years later, I went back to the same physical building, the same machine, and I couldn't see it right now. It was as if somebody had injected uh, some smog, uh, fog in between my naked eye and what I was trying to see. And I said, hmm, I wish, you know, you know, think of Aladdin's uh, magic carpet. You know, I love Stan, Terminator, all the whole night. So I'm like, man, what if something could just appear, make things bigger, fold back up and disappear? That's all I really needed. <laughs> so from 98, that, that idea was at the back of my head. Now, I have to remember that's when dialogue was, I don't know, the audience remembers dial-up. <laughs> so there was no chance of finding the piece of technology to get this started at all. I didn't even, I couldn't even spell neuroscience at that time. But the idea remained. I mean, that's, you know, how uh, entrepreneurship and innovation starts, right? And that's why I really love innovation very much. And so through all my struggles with uh, college, I always knew, you know, uh, why did I flunk out? Because one day I sat and I couldn't see the board anymore. <laughs> like, man, what if I just had this magic do its thing, you know? And, and various scenarios, you know, go to a restaurant, can't see the menu up front, um, to the ACT, same problem. Um, so time as time went by, you know, it just it was at the back of my mind. And then um, 2012, uh, after 300 IK professionals, they tell me all these uh, problems that I have. And I started looking at the symptoms like, hmm, okay, fine. I understand it's always fluctuating. I understand it's always declining. I understand the symptoms better because, you know, when you're experiencing it, you don't get a text or a tweet that you're losing your vision. Like you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. I've had uh, two near federal car accidents when I used to drive. Right? when I should have not been driving, <laughs> but no, I didn't know. You just don't know. Um, I went I'm to the new normal over time. Yeah, right? you know, uh, David had crashed three cars before he ended up at the school for the blind with me. You just don't know. And, and so um, now I, I, I had a, a medical explanation of why the chaos existed. So now it's, hmm, okay, you're, you're a computer engineer figure it out. You know, my uncle always told me, you gotta learn to you know, solve problems. And so now um, Google Glass dropped. And coincidentally, you know, I had been sketching very similar images to what that would look like. And so like, wow, that's Google Glass. And then I learned about neuroscience. You know, um, I saw this neuroscience, uh, brainwave EEG, a wearable reader. Like, huh. And then I started writing doctors. I said, from Johns Hopkins to UCL London, top doctor. I said, look, you can take A plus B plus C plus D. That was how the email read. <laughs> Maybe one day I should publish those emails. And nobody understood what I was talking about for three years till I put it together. So in essence, the goal was back to that 1998. I'm looking at something. I'm struggling to see. Is there some type of magic that could detect that I'm struggling to see? and take that piece of information as a signal to send to the magnifier, to magnify to the extent that I need. And how did I uh, prove it? Well, by leveraging uh, an EEG sensor, electroencephalogram uh, sensor that touches your uh, forehead, it grabs your brain waves and treats it as data. And then it sends that data to an uh, electronic magnifier. And so you can look think and zoom in to see better. And that's where the name think and zoom comes from. And then I was able to create other things from it. Um, think and read, meaning if you're struggling to see, it grabs text characters and turns them to audio so you can listen for people who are totally blind. And then as well as a think game, which won an award at Apple uh, Worldwide Developer Conference. So that's think and zoom. Fantastic. And as you've gone through the process of founding this company, introducing it to market, speaking with investors, um, what has that experience been like to you? Do people really understand some of the challenges that you're facing? Um, and what have you seen resonate with people around products and services focused on accessibility? 
people haven't understood otherwise we wouldn't be here having this conversation <laughs> right um on one hand um it's just really fascinating you know when i walk into a room to pitch about blindness and i'm introducing myself as being blind um it took me a while to even figure out that people still didn't understand even till today what i'm talking about so there's a couple of confusion there. It's A, I'm saying I'm blind. But wait a minute, you can see me. Can't you see me? Yeah, but you're blurry. What do you mean by it's blood, right? So that's that confusion, right? Um, because, you know, you're trying to talk about a problem that you understand. <laughs> then the second thing is, what do people understand about blindness? People just don't. Um, only about 5% of the blind population of uh, roughly 285 million are truly totally blind with very little light perception or nothing. Blindness is a spectrum. People don't understand that. <laughs> People don't understand the cutoff mark between visual acuity of 2020 to 2070 visually impaired to the low vision between 2040 all the way to 2200, which is now legal blindness. People don't understand that. You can also be legally blind from a different angle where it's not uh, your visual acuity, you know, just looking straight. It's not your uh, field of vision. And that comes through retinitis pigmentosa, which gives you tunnel vision. The tunnel keeps going, you know, smaller and keeps shrinking in circumference, what you can see. Um, so, so that was there. And then the second issue was this uh, brain computer interface like what are you talking about I, I spoke on a panel last year called BCI um, science or science fiction and I spoke alongside Neuralink Elon Musk's company that has just raised 300 million dollars uh, and also alongside Synchron another uh, minimally invasive uh, company doing BCA that had raised $50 million. So generically, people still didn't, people didn't understand either. And so that was a, a huge uh, challenge in trying to raise the needed uh, funding, right? And then um, the same investors will say, okay, fine. I, I, I get that this BCI is a margin technology, but why do you want to offer it to people who are disabled? Not realizing they're actually talking, they're, they're asking me, why do you want a high-end luxury, you know, cutting edge piece of technology for productivity, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, not realizing they're actually talking to me. And so those hurdles were there every day and made it very challenging. I couldn't uh, I raise the funding. And so it, I, I have firsthand experience of, you know, the lack of awareness, the lack of education. Um, that you know the invest uh, the investors have about about this space they just don't understand. Yeah, I have I have two more questions for you around this, and you can answer these in whatever order you prefer because they're kind of interrelated. But um, have you seen progress on that front since you started this journey and started with Think and Zoom? We know that the VC community, and this is a big piece of your message is not tapping into the potential of serving the disability economy or the disabled market. Have you seen positive changes over time, at least with the way people are thinking or talking or a deepening of understanding? And the other piece of this is in our prep call, we've talked about the disability movement. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that so that people know where to look when they wanna learn more about this stuff and some of the advancements that have been made by the, by the movement, um, particularly if they have a focus on tech and how tech can increase accessibility? In terms of um, movement, uh, progress, um, you know, where you, you're dealing with 1.3 billion people and I can count the events on two hands. <laughs> it wow. would, we haven't gone far enough yet, right? Um, I know that, you know, Canada's first um, accelerator dedicated to disabled founders, access to success, 
just opened last year. I know because I spoke on the panel there. Uh, I know that here in America, the first um, tech cohort of an accelerator dedicated to disabled founders was just last year at 2GI. And it had support from Google for startups. I know because I was an inclusive innovator there. I know that um, Verizon is running its very first accelerator dedicated to disability innovations. I know because I'm an EIR over there. Yep. So these are just, yeah, it, we haven't even, <laughs> we haven't even- Yeah, cracking the that. surface. Um, last year, uh, Remarkable Tech Australia um, launched Plus IN Inclusive Innovation Network. And you'll see hubs around the world that are dedicating themselves to disability tech. And you'll see that there's a huge gap in the United States not being represented. And so here in America, we really need to get things going. And Remarkable Tech has been running um, their disability for cross accelerator for five years. And Remarkable Tech is owned by Cerebral Palsy Australia, a nonprofit. So we're not talking Silicon Valley here. Right. And so after five years now, they've now launched here in the United States, all the way from Australia. So, you know, that's just the, the, the state of things. And then when you talk about just, you know, progress in general, um, if you notice, uh, I think the first time the Oscar had a red carpet for disabled people was last year. And I think this year they added uh, audio captioning for people who are deaf. Interesting. And who was the best male actor? A deaf actor. And who was the best picture? Children of deaf adults. A movie about disabled people. Wow. So, and that was the 88th Oscar, I think. <laughs> wow. Right? So. Well, I, I know that you like to get into the stats and numbers. I mean, what does it look like for disabled tech founders, um, investors, uh, in disability tech specifically, you know, what is that? How's that looking? <laughs> Not looking good, right? <laughs> and that's why we're having this conversation. There is a massive opportunity. So, you know, with the whole world trying to be more inclusive, right? Um, it, it, it's covered all, all the verticals, right? But not disability. You know, it, ha it hasn't looked at disability yet. And so um, there's this huge gaping hole that has to be, that must be filled. Now, um, um, corporations have started doing something. Question is, what are they doing and why? Well, uh, two years ago, um, no, three years ago now, um, there's a lady, she's legally blind, Carolyn Casey. She went to the World Economic Forum and told them that disability is a global crisis. That was the first time disability took center stage. Her supporter was Richard Bronson, who had revealed that he had dyslexia. And she was also supported by Paul Pullman, who was a chairman at Unilever, I believe. So now, what was her dream? What was her ambition? What was her goal? to bring together 500 of the world's top corporations under one roof to focus on disability. 500 companies, corporations, enterprises, $100 billion companies to do what? <laughs> that is crazy, right? Well, um, she came to, this was in Davos, Switzerland, and then she came to Austin, Texas, South by Southwest, where I met with her and really had a great conversation with her. And I just happened to be at the UN Geneva, Switzerland a few months later. So I took the message over there. I think it's on one of their YouTube channels. Well, two years later, 500 companies agreed. She had to pitch to 5,000 though, but 500 agreed. Right now, remember, she is legally blind. So she's not going to give up. <laughs> she's lived with it all her life, right? So she wants to bring about change. There's no stopping. Somehow, somewhere, we're going to get this done. Now, when we talk about 500 companies, Apple is number 500. That's the caliber of companies we're talking about here. 
We're talking about over 22 million employees. We're talking about revenue surpassing $8 trillion. We're talking about 36 country headquarter footprint, massive corporations, Verizon, Microsoft, BBC, Google, the who's who of who's who. Right? Yep. And, um, and, and so for the startups, if you look at it that these massive corporations have decided to tackle disability from the C-suite level, boardroom leadership agenda, then you start trickling it down. So what's next? Well, the CEO is gonna to talk to the chief CSR. So she's responsible to do something, right? So your responsibility is responsible for what? Uh, ESG, environment, uh, social, and governance. Well, CSR will say, okay, I need a head of accessibility. Hey, head of accessibility, do something, right? And LinkedIn has reported a 78% increase in accessibility titles on LinkedIn, 78% year to year. That is incredible, right? And so now these companies, are pushing, pushing, pushing to get these things done. Well, what's next? Well, somebody has to now provide the nuts and bolts and the wires, right? That's where startups come in. Because now these heads of accessibility, they have to make a decision. Do I have the talent? Do I have the resources to build it in-house? If I can not build it in-house, let me go buy from outside. Yep. Well, That's and you- where startups come in. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, if you have thoughts, and we could follow up after the conversation, but if there's third parties that do support this kind of work, we'd love to share a list like that, um, especially if they work with startups. Um, you said something really interesting in our, our prep conversation about the training you've received at Harvard and MIT on entrepreneurship focuses on innovation as a way to maximize return on investment. And so that means addressing as many markets as possible. And I think it's a simple way to make the business case that we're talking about 1.3 billion people here who deal with disability at this point in time. This isn't like the race or the ethnicity or gender that you're born. It's, it's something that is, we may encounter. If you live long enough, you likely will encounter it. So it's important that we're all thinking about it and making an effort to be more inclusive. Um, I've also heard you say in one of your talks that it's important for makers to be users. And that really stuck with me. I think one of the challenges that founders might face is understanding how disability intersects with their company or with their particular industry. So for example, if you're an e-commerce startup, it might not be immediately obvious to you as to how your product impacts the disabled community and why that matters and why that matters for your business. Um, so what advice might you give to someone trying to figure that out and make inclusion more of a central focus? So it's not just um, doing it for doing the sake. Um, and you know, your audience can do this research. Um, it, it's showing now that companies that prioritize uh, inclusion see a 28% higher uh, revenue when compared to their peers. So there is return on the uh, investment. Um, you know, uh, Bill Gates started uh, Microsoft with a focus on uh, computing for the enterprise. You know, all corporations, governments all had uh, you know, Windows running. And hmm, it's not bad, right? Now, Satya took over. And um, he's now made it computing for everyone and has grown it from when it took over about $500 billion to, I stopped counting at $2 trillion. I think that's a lot of zeros, right? Um, uh, Microsoft just uh, had their Ability Summit uh, last week. So every year they invest a lot of money uh, putting on these summits. Uh, their chief accessibility officer is Jenny Lee Firu. She's deaf, hard of hearing. Um, they just debuted um, adaptive mouse, a whole bunch of accessories targeting 400 million gamers who are disabled. Did you know that 400 million people who are disabled are also gamers? Right? Um, and, and so 
we're, we're now looking at numbers, right? And, and return on investment. Um, the disability economy is, you know, uh, $8 trillion, but it's really the spending power of the disabled individual and their families. You know, just last week at the Exhibition Tech Summit at Capital Factory, a wheelchair user said, you know, um, she and her grandmother shop at the same place because, you know, her grandmother says, well, if they support you, I'm going to spend my money there as well. So that's how it goes with the disability community. And so for the startup that is, you know, doing e-commerce, well, is, have you put any thought into your website? Um, if there's a video content, is there any uh, captioning? Uh, so there's somebody who's deaf, hard of hearing, who can, you know, uh, uh, in just at least learn about what your video is talking about, right? Um, over the last two weeks, Apple just added live caption. Interesting. So it, and it, not, it, sorry for interrupting you. No I just problem. want to say, I've been noticing um, on social media, like on Instagram, uh, certain brands doing captioning as well. Yeah, and, and so what I, the, the, the message I'm trying to uh, uh, put out there is sort of look at what the, the big brands are doing, yep. right? And, and don't be, you know, left behind. Um, there's a certain name, um, Kardashians, right? <laughs> we all know them, Kim Kardashian. She has a clothing line called Skims. Now, why on earth would I be talking about Kim Kardashian and her clothing line? <laughs> it's because they have created an adaptive line of clothing for people who are disabled. I mean, if Kim Kardashian cares enough <laughs> about this. Yeah. You don't I mean, have an excuse. <laughs> right. And Me so uh, there are the, the, the known people like, you know, PNG and all these um, companies that make shampoo. They're now putting real dots for um, people who are blind. They're hiring uh, disabled people to lead their uh, accessibility MasterCard. If I'm not mistaken, they may have come around the 1970s, but they just released a, a new uh, piece of plastic card with Brill for their blind consumers. So it's not even, you know, uh, my, you know, it's not even from me, right? It's like, just, just look around you, look at what everybody's doing. Um, the first accessible hotel opened up in Birmingham, um, uh, United Kingdom. Well, another one just opened up in Virginia, United States. Hmm. So things are changing. Interesting. Um, those are super helpful examples, Yubi. Thanks for sharing those. Um, we have five more minutes with you. So I do want to invite anybody listening in to share a question if you have one. This is a good time. But um, I also wanted to get into, while we're on this topic of what companies can be doing. So let's talk about like hiring and recruiting and sort of focus on that part of the pipeline. Um, what are some simple things that startups with limited resources might be able to do? And, and I'm, I'm guessing you might say something like a statement on a website or language within the job spec. Could you give us a few specifics about what you might be looking for that really reflects an organization that's taking inclusion seriously and, um, you know, trying to advance this conversation. So historically, disabled people have been excluded. And so if, if that community is not invited, chances are they won't show up because that's just how society has had it. Um, there are countries that do not even teach math I'm talking about grade school math to blind children. Wow. That's where they're cut off, countries. Um, so um, I'd say the first thing is just awareness. You know, um, it's through it's 1.3 billion people, but, but what does that really mean? What it means is that <clears throat> not everybody is born disabled majority occurs after birth. You know, there are genetic 
uh, problems that manifest later on in life. But also, what about the athlete or the uh, military veteran who just had a knee surgery? Now they have to use a wheelchair, mm -hmm. right? Um, what about the 80-year-old person who no longer has the strength to walk? Now they have to use a wheelchair or walker. So it's not all about you know, the people who have cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy, right? So just that awareness, right? And then um, understand what is you know, assistive technology so that the wheelchair is, an, is a technology that assists the disabled person, right? But then understand the difference between that and an accessible solution. The hotel needs to be accessible. Everybody needs to go in and out. Imagine somebody with a wheelchair finding their way to the building, but they cannot get in, right? And then um, try to familiarize yourself with disabled innovators in order to change your perception of the first thing I, I, I talked about. You know, Sasha Blair Goldenson, um, 10 years ago, had an accident, became a wheelchair user will go to places in New York to meet up with colleagues and he can't get into the building because he was a Google employee, he used his 20% time, built a team. They started crowdsourcing locations will, uh, that were wheelchair accessible. And after they gained critical mass, they pitched to Google Maps. So Sasha, a wheelchair user, a disabled innovator, disabled user innovator is responsible for bringing wheelchair accessible locations to Google Maps and this happened in the last two years. Um, Ralph Teeter, a blind mechanical engineer, was the one that put the cruise control in your vehicle because he couldn't see every time it was a passenger, the cars would jerk and stop. And being a mechanical engineer, he found a solution. The gentleman that uh, co-invented the uh, HTTP protocol, TCP IP protocol, um, is deaf and hard of hearing. Today we call him the father of the internet, but most people don't understand the reason why he was looking for a way to be able to communicate using text characters over the internet with his family. Vint Cerf, he has won all awards from here to that kingdom come, right? So, you know, no, um, I mean, even in, in um, acquiring customers and trying to cross the chasm, right? You go from your innovators to your um, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and like it. Right? Well, in, in yes, I love that book. <laughs> there, are, there are also disabled innovators, you know, I, and so many of them. Um, I belong to uh, a, a team called Astro Access. There are 12 of us researchers crazy enough to take on space. Um, we're not just inclusive space travel ambassadors. We're not just disabled astronauts in training. We are actually inclusive space travel innovators. What does that mean? Well, nobody's ever done this before. We are having to build the solutions that we need in order for us to get to space. We've partnered with MIT Media Lab to create these solutions and prototypes. And so without knowing that, you know, um, there are amazing, um, you know, technical and business talent in this community, it closes your mind off, right? And so awareness, education, familiarity will be first, you know, set your uh, mindset and, and perception, set them right. And then inclusive hiring you know, hire the, the right talent, but then have in place the resources, you know, don't um, hire someone who's deaf of hard of hearing without having accommodations for them to succeed. Um, mm -hmm. Parva, one of my teammates at Astro Access, um, he's deaf and hard of hearing, applied to NASA. He was rejected based on being deaf and hard of hearing, but that didn't stop NASA from hiring him to be a three-time uh, mission control director. So That's wonderful. <laughs> it's good enough for mission control, right? But they didn't want to hire him to the astronaut program. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, as we wrap up, I think this tone really comes from the top. Um, I think that 
advocating for disability and disability inclusion, even in early stage startup, really shapes relationships with employees and how people view the environment, how they view the team, um, the level of openness, awareness, et cetera, and being able to come forth with your, with your own things, whatever they might be. Um, so this, this just has a much broader impact to demonstrate awareness, as, as you've mentioned, and um, demonstrate awareness and also cultivate conversation around how do we uh, service the, dis the disability market as well with our product? How are we accounting for impact that we're having on people who are disabled? Um, so thank you, Zuby, for all your insights in this conversation. And thank you for the really fantastic examples that you've shared. I think that um, this practical advice is really useful. And I really think that some of these things, any, any early stage company could go ahead and just get started. Just take that first step. So Absolutely. we appreciate having you here today. Thank you so much, Courtney. Again, it's really a great uh, a pleasure to be here with you. And um, you know, I just encourage you know everybody just um, educate yourself, be aware, have a mindset shift, and remember, there's an eight trillion dollar economy out there, and you know, it's, it's revenue, it's numbers, right? And uh, give everybody the opportunity to be able to look, think, and zoom into their better, brighter future. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Zuby. And we look forward to the Disability Summit in October. Thanks so much, Gordon. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining.